all down, it would be these three functions. So we're going to look at how they're useful uh, for solving missing sides. Uh, OK, missing sides of a right triangle, which is going to have applications in real life. We're going to look at um, how to graph these functions and in particular, are they functions and, and they are if you recall what the definition of a function is and we'll talk about that more later whether or not they're invertible functions because if you you might remember that to be invertible you have to have certain properties um yeah the graphs of the functions uh and then a bunch of identities that come from uh these three functions identities are equations that are true for every input basically it's all just going to come back to these functions though all right, with an input of an angle and an output of some number. <clears throat> OK. So let's talk about 5.1, get straight into the material. 5.1 is called just angle measure. So an angle just to have a uh, nice definition here is just two rays with a common vertex. With a common vertex. So remember a ray is just the. It's a line, but it only goes uh, in one direction like that, right? So two rays, so I could draw another ray over here, but they're supposed to have a common vertex. And remember, this is the vertex, so there we go. That's an angle there. We call, depending on the way the angle is oriented, if the angle has gone this way, then we call this part the initial side, initial side, and we call this part the terminal side because that's where it terminates, the terminal side. <clears throat> okay, here's an extra note. If an angle is, uh, let's just say, let's not be too worried about the wording here, is moving uh, counterclock or is measured counterclockwise, counterclockwise, it is positive. If an angle is moving or measured clockwise, so this way, it is, it is negative. <clears throat> okay, so I might have an angle on the plane, the x, y axis here. I might have an angle Starting here with initial side, often our angles are going to start on that positive x axis and then going down this way. And I might measure it going this way and say that that angle is maybe, you know, negative 60 degrees because it's going, it's being measured clockwise. Okay, so that's just some terminology, getting comfortable with the idea of an angle. Uh, is the definition of an angle going to be super important? No, your intuitive understanding of an angle is fine. Is Are these definitions going to be important? Yes, especially terminal side. Um, whenever we're talking about angles, I'm often going to refer to the terminal or initial side. So these are important, but they're very easy, right? They're very straightforward is what they are. And is positive versus negative going to be important? Yes, that will also be an important concept. So, but it's also pretty straightforward. If the angle is being measured this way, counterclockwise, it's positive. The other way, it's negative. Okay. <clears throat> Let's keep moving to Uh, let's define the measure. I've already written down the measure of an angle, but let me just say precisely what it is. The measure of an angle, the measure of an angle is, we could just say the amount 
of rotation, the amount of rotation. The amount of rotation. <clears throat> a full rotation all the way around back to the starting point is 360 degrees. 360 degrees. So if I have some angle with uh, an initial side on the positive X axis and it goes all the way around back here and it ends on the positive X axis, then that would be a 360 degree angle. A uh, half rotation just turning around is a 180 and of course right there would be a 90 degree angle, right? A right angle. If it moves from here pointing straight up, that would be 90 degrees. OK, so if a full rotation is 360 degrees, that means we can actually define a degree. A degree. Is one 360th of a full rotation, which is like, OK, maybe you were expecting something a little bit more, but that's that's what we're going to call a degree. A single degree is just one out of 360 of a full rotation. That makes sense though, right? If a full rotation is 360 degrees, then one degree is just one out, one out of those 360. Okay. <clears throat> so, so far, you probably already know about, you know, know that angles can be measured in degrees. So nothing wild happening so far. And you may even think, you know, this definition is. It makes sense, but maybe like not super useful, right? And I would kind of agree like we all pretty much know what degrees are. We're comfortable with them. If I ask you um, as in, in fact, let's just do a quick example. Uh, draw. An angle. With a measure of 190 degrees. So we're going to start with the coordinate plane. Because that will be the context for most of our problems. Initial side will be that positive X axis. If I wanted to draw an angle with a measure of 190 degrees, well, if you know that all the way over here to the negative X axis is 180 degrees, like a straight angle all the way across facing the opposite direction, that's 180. Then I need to go a little bit further to draw a 190 degree angle. And this little half circle there, that little line, that curve is showing you that I'm measuring counterclockwise, so a positive angle. OK, no problems so far. How about defining radians? So maybe you've never heard of a radian. <clears throat> radian is another way to measure the size of an angle, uh, but it's a little bit more involved than just a degree. A radian technically is the length of the arc. that subtends an angle. Hmm. I left out a part. The length of the arc. Hmm. I should, I'll just add it here at the end. On a circle of radius one. Now, in the videos that I asked you all to watch, they actually have a nice animation of what this means. Uh, but I will do. At least I think that's where I saw it, but I'll draw it for you. It'll be just fine here. So what, what the heck does all this mean? Well, first of all, an arc is like a piece of a circle, like a like a line segment. Well, we wouldn't call it a line segment, but a chunk of a circle like just the outside edge. That's an arc subtends. So an arc that subtends an angle. So what is that? Well, let me start by drawing a circle. OK, that's not bad. All right. And I'm going to draw an angle in this circle, so I'm going to start vertex at the center of the circle because that's most natural. I'll start with my initial side there and I'll draw. 
in my terminal side there. OK, and I'm measuring this way. Then the arc that subtends this angle is this piece here, this piece right here. The arc that subtends the angle. So that's just that's just the, the terminology we use to describe that arc there. And when it says subtends the angle, the angle is right there. So if the angle is bigger, then the arc that subtends that angle is going to be bigger. OK, <clears throat> now I said a circle of radius one. So if this radius is one, then what that means is a radian is the length of this arc here. So the length of this arc is equal to the angle that gives you that arc there. So a little, little weird, but that's what a radian is. So if I was going to draw a measure here, this would be one radian. This would be one radian right there. OK, and then if I was going to draw another one, this would be two radians, two radians. Well, from here to here would be two radians. And then another one would be three radians. And then <clears throat> you might see where I'm going with this all the way across, all the way straight across will be pi radians. So I'm going to write it here, but then I'll write it in words, pi radians. So let me write out what is going on here. So on a circle of radius one, just like the simplest case, a circle of radius one, the angle that in degree form that we would consider, what do we call that straight angle going all the way across, not all the way around the circle, but just halfway there, that's 180 degrees. So an angle that we would consider as 180 degrees in, in its measure, so the size of it is 180 degrees, is equal to how many radians? Well, 3.1415, etc. So pi radians. <clears throat> OK, so I'll say more about this in a bit. But I kind of want to get straight into how we can use this idea to go back and forth between radians and degrees. So what do I have here? On a circle of radius one, the angle that we would consider as 180 degrees in measure is equal to pi radians. So I have an equation, uh, I, I have an identity, or rather, no, an equation, 180 degrees, a conversion rate is what I'm trying to say, is equal to pi radians. We abbreviate radians, R-A-D, radians. 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. This conversion rate allows us to convert back and forth between degrees and radians. <clears throat> OK. So let's get into some examples. Ooh, I'm out of paper. One second. So this conversion rate, and if you recall, a conversion rate is just like 
uh, like for example, one foot equals 12 inches. That's a conversion rate that allows you to transform back and forth or convert back and forth between feet and inches. So this is our conversion rate for degrees to radians. I'll rewrite it because we are going to use it. Example one, A, convert 108, uh, 20 degrees to radians. So again, radians are another way to describe the measure of an angle. How do I use this 180 degrees is equal to pi radians? Well, I say 120 degrees. How do you use a conversion rate? If you've taken uh, any kind of science or anything where you have to convert uh, measurements, you remember you multiply by the conversion rate, something over itself, or rather something over something else, and they both come from this conversion rate. You put the thing that you want to get rid of in the bottom. I want to get rid of degrees, so I put that side in the denominator and I put my pi radians on top, and then I follow through with my fraction multiplication, I'm gonna simplify the fractions and all that. So I'm ending up with degrees, the unit of degrees is canceling, and I'm ending, ending up with 120 pi over 180 radians, which hopefully you see, you know, there's a lot of simplification to be done here. Easiest thing right off the bat, get rid of that extra power of 10. I'm just stuffing that pi up in the numerator. 12 over 18 can pull a 6 out of both, leaving me with a 2 pi on top. So the pi just carrying along. Pull a 6 out of the bottom and left with a 3. There we go. So 120 degrees is equal to 2 pi over 3 radians. If you wanted to approximate this answer, you could plug this into the calculator, uh, but uh, this is a good answer. It's an exact answer. <clears throat> How about convert 3 pi over 4 to degrees? Oops, radians, radians to, if it's got a pi involved, it's pretty much always going to be a measurement in radians. Uh, but I'll try to remember to put it there just to emphasize that it is in uh, radians. Okay, so I'll take 3 pi on 4, and I'll multiply by the numbers coming from this conversion rate. I want to get rid of radians. Again, I left it off, radians. I want to get rid of radians, so I'll put that pi radians in the bottom. I'll put my 180 degrees on top. The unit radians cancels, and in fact, the pi cancels, so I end up with 3 times 180 all over 4, and this is in degrees now. I just need to clean it up. Uh, so how many times does 4 go into 180? Uh, 45 right 45 so i end up with 3 times 45 and this is measured in degrees and that's giving me 135 degrees so 3 pi over 4 radians is 135 degrees so this should give you an idea for how big a radian is also, this kind of gives you an idea too. If a little bit more than three radians, 3.14 radians is 180 degrees, then we can say one radian must be like roughly less than 60 degrees. You know, uh, let's see, can I tell you exactly? I'll give you some approximation. Roughly 57 degrees. <clears throat> so that kind of gives you an idea of how big a radian is. OK. OK, so just stop me if you have questions. You can use the little raise your hand button, but I'm going to keep moving straight through. All right, standard position. 
of an angle. In, uh, an angle is in standard position if the, I'm going to say initial side, I've already drawn all of our angles in standard position, pretty much we'll always do that. Initial side is on the positive x-axis. And the vertex, where else would it be? Is at the origin. Okay, so this is pretty much like the natural way of drawing an angle on the coordinate plane. If I give you the coordinate plane x, y, where else would you really draw an angle, right? The most natural place is to have that starting side on the positive side of the x-axis and the vertex at the origin. And then, you know, whatever, wherever you need the terminal side to be, depending on what the angle is. Okay, so that's a very, very simple definition. It's not super important. It's just to get us on the same page. In fact, I won't even I won't even really use it that much because if I'm talking about an angle, if it's anywhere but at the normal place, then you know that would be a weird problem, and I would make sure to emphasize that the angle is not in standard position. So you can pretty much assume most of the all of the angles probably we're going to deal with are going to be in standard position. OK, now here comes an important definition that you will need to work with coterminal angles. Two angles are coterminal with one another. If their sides coincide meaning they have the same sides, terminal and uh, initial, if their sides coincide. So for instance, if I give you the angle 60 degree, a 60 degree angle, I'll draw it like this. 60 degree angle here, so we'll say 60 degrees. I can draw another angle that is coterminal with this angle by starting at so their sides need to coincide so the same terminal side same terminal side but what if i go past the angle and then all the way back around now they have the same terminal side or rather same initial side and same terminal side but the angle that i've drawn is not 60 degrees anymore it's 420 degrees because i went 60 well i went all the way around which is 360 and then 60 more. So this is coming from all the way around once plus that 60 degree angle. So this is an example of an angle, two angles that are coterminal, that are coterminal. Okay, straight into an example now. Example two. <clears throat> example two. Find two positive angles. This is kind of mimicking the homework problem you'll see. And two negative angles. That are coterminal with, actually let's make that the instructions for example two, and then here comes part A, with 210 degrees. So what I can do is kind of mimic what I did back here and just add a whole nother revolution. So I'll start with 210 degrees and how about I add an entire revolution? Because that'll get me back to the exact same angle. So 210 plus 360, that'll give me 570. OK, and then how do I find another positive angle? Well, I can just add another 360 to it. I can add another 360, so I can do 210 plus 360 is 570, and then plus another 360 gives me 930. So I'm adding multiples of 360.
just adding whole revolutions, adding whole revolutions. Now, what about two negative angles? Well, if adding, if I can take 210 degrees and just circle all the way back around to get to a, another coterminal angle with it, just adding 360, I can also subtract multiples. So go in reverse, starting at 210, which by the way, I haven't drawn it yet, but where would 210 be? Uh, I'll draw it here. This is 180, so it'd be like 30 degrees past. There's 210 degrees. So, so far I've drawn an angle going all the way around and then all the way around again. What if I go backwards? <clears throat> I can subtract multiples. I can get there by subtracting multiples of 360 degrees. So I'll start with my 210 and subtract 360 and I'll get negative 150, subtract another 360 and I'll get negative 510 degrees. Which by the way, does negative 150 work? Well, think about negative 150. So I'll just look at this one in particular. Does it end up at this angle? Negative 150 means I'm measuring counter, or sorry, measuring clockwise from the positive x axis. This would be 90, right? From here to here, from here to here would be 90. I need to go 60 more degrees. That pretty much looks like it would end there. So that's the negative 150. So confirming there that that does, uh, in fact, it is coterminal with this uh, 210 degree angle. Okay. <clears throat> okay, let me check. Are we good? We're good. All right. Part B same instructions find two positive angles, two negative angles that are coterminal, this time with 3 pi on 4. 3 pi on 4. This is in radians, understood to be in radians because there's no degree symbol. OK, last time I added multiples of 360 or subtracted multiples of 360. What's the corresponding thing to do in terms of radians? Well, I know that pi is equal to 180 radians. So since pi is equal to Oh, sorry, I said that backwards, 180 degrees. Since pi is equal to 180 degrees, pi radians, then 2 pi radians will be equal to 360, just multiplying by 2 on both sides. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 3 pi on 4, and I'm going to add multiples of 2 pi and subtract multiples of 2 pi to get 4 more angles, 2 negative, 2 positive, that are coterminal with 3, uh, uh, three pi on 4. So I'm going to take 3 pi on 4. I'm going to add 2 pi. I'm actually going to write it out just so you, you know, just as a quick example of uh, adding fractions, right? Common denominators, all that stuff. Just, just a quick refresher. So this first positive one, I'm adding 2 pi. This is the same as 3 pi, well, denominator of 4. 3 pi plus 8 pi. Right, just common denominator there. And that's going to be 11 pi over 4. So there's 1. And then I'll take another 2 pi added on there. So 11 pi over 4 plus 2 pi is the same as 11 pi plus 8 pi all over 4. Common denominator there. Is the 8 pi over 4 is the 2 pi. And that's giving me 19 pi over 4. So there's my two positive angles that are coterminal with this angle, 3 pi on 4. Now, are these the only positive angles that are coterminal? No, of course, there are infinitely many. There are infinitely many, but I've just chosen the two smallest ones. I could add any multiple of 2 pi. I could add 18 pi, and I would get an angle that's coterminal with this, but these are the simplest ones, right? Now the next two I'm going to be subtracting. So I'm starting at the beginning, 3 pi on 4. So they will end up being negative. So minus 2 pi. Can I skip this step and just say it would be 3 pi minus 8 pi all over 4, which will give me negative 5 pi on 4. Okay. And then if I want another negative one, 
I'll take that one I just got and subtract another revolution. So remember, 2 pi here is a full revolution. So I've gone two full revolutions in the uh, counterclockwise direction to get these two positive ones, and now I'm going clockwise to get the uh, negative ones. So I'm subtracting again, skipping my common denominator steps because I'm trying to rush, and I'm getting negative 13 pi over 4. OK. Next example is three, example three. As I write this, are there any questions so far? Think about any questions you have as I write this uh, example. No questions. OK, so this one says find an angle between 0 and 360 degrees that is coterminal with this giant angle. So that means I've given you some massive angle, right? 11,000 or rather uh, 1,170 degrees. And I'm trying to say can you just get this so that it doesn't have all these extra revolutions? Because clearly it has extra revolutions because it's bigger than 360. So putting the angle theta is, is the what we call it. So theta is between 0 and 360. Forcing the angle to be between these two, uh, 0 and 360, means it doesn't have any extra revolutions. It'll just revolve one time within this span. So how can I figure this out? Well. I can start to chop off extra revolutions. So I'll subtract multiples of 360. I'll just do it one at a time because this number is big, but it's not huge. So I think it's fine to just start subtracting until I get within this range. So I'll say uh, 810. Subtract again because 810 clearly still too big. OK, getting closer now, 450 minus 360 is going to be 90. There we go. So that theta is what they asked me to call it. So theta is equal to 90 degrees. So if I was to draw this, what have I just done? The angle they gave 1170, 1170 degrees. It goes around once, right there. It goes around twice, and then it goes around three times, and then finally it ends at the 90 degree mark right there. And our angle that we said, look, this is much simpler. Let's get rid of all these extra revolutions. Our angle has the exact same initial side that this angle has. I should say the initial side is here, right? The initial side and then the terminal side is here because it's an ending at that 90 degree mark. <clears throat> Our angle that we drew has the same initial side, clearly starting on the positive x-axis and then ending at the 90 degree mark there. There's our theta that we got. Has the same initial side, same terminal side. These angles are coterminal. And this one is much simpler, easier to look at. Doesn't have all those extra revolutions. All right. <clears throat> well, I'll leave that there for a moment in case you need it. All right. Where are we? Arc length. OK, moving straight into a new topic. So we've talked about coterminal angles. I want to talk about arc length now. So I told you what an arc is. It's a piece of it's a piece of a circle. So to find arc length, uh, to find the length of an arc, the arc length of some arc. which I'll call S, we'll call it S 
for arc. Uh, uh, that's traditions to use S to find arc length of some arc S that is subtended by an angle that is subtended by an angle theta. We multiply the circumference. Now I'm building a formula for you here. So it's OK if you just want to watch this and then at the end of this little spiel that I'm giving, you can just write the formula that we're going to come up with. Multiply the circumference of the whole circle. By. The piece of the circle. That we have OK, what does this mean? Let me get a picture down. So we have, I'm going to start with my circle. OK, now I've got some arc. So let me draw my angle first, my angle which I'm calling theta, and my arc from here to here is S. That's my S. And then since I am talking about, it's in the context of a circle, right? The angle is inside of a circle. We'll call this radius r just to be general and since it mentions circumference we will need r there right so what is the piece of the circle we have what does that mean what is this piece of the circle well it's some fraction of the circle right if our angle was 90 degrees wouldn't we have a quarter of the circle right if it was like a 90 degree angle we would have a quarter of that full arc if it was 180 degrees all the way across, we would have half of the circle, right? So the piece of the circle that we have is the angle over 2 pi, the fraction of the circle that we have, 2 pi being the whole revolution. <clears throat> the angle that we have divided by the entire uh, circle. That's the ratio of the angle that we have there. So we're going to multiply that. That piece of the circle we have by the circumference. So we're going to say. Arc length is equal to. Circumference 2 pi R times. That piece of the circle that we have and we're going to clean it up. What do we get? 2 pi clean cancels out. We're just left with R theta. So we have arc length is equal to radius times the angle that is subtending that arc. OK. Nice clean formula for arc length there. That's arc length. Nice and clean, no shenanigans, just three numbers involved. The length of the arc, the radius of this circle here, and the angle that subtends that arc. OK. Mm, one second, let me read this and make sure this makes sense before I write it down. And then we'll we'll do an example too. Sure, that makes sense. OK. So real quick back to radians. Here's just a note. Now that we have this uh, this written down, we can say the radian measure, the radian measure, radians are a bit weird, but here's another way to interpret them. The radian measure theta, because it is an angle, right, theta, is the number of radii or radiuses, I'll say radii, uh, that can fit in the arc that subtends the angle theta. So what does that mean? Like, well, I think I can draw a picture to kind of explain that. So the angle measure in radians is exactly equal to the number of radii that you can squish into that arc, the arc length. 
So in other words, if I draw some circle here and then um, I have some angle just like that, and then this is R, so it's radius R. A radian, this angle here will be one radian if this arc length here is also, or if this arc length is equal to the radius of the circle. So can I write that down, what I just said? One radian is the measure of an angle is the measure of an angle that subtends an arc of length what? What is the length r, the radius, that, that subtends, subtends an arc of length that is equal to the radius of the circle? of the circle. OK, I'll draw another picture because I know this is weird. <clears throat> or maybe it's not. Maybe you've already understood what radians are, but I remember when I first learned them, it was like kind of weird, hard to wrap your head around. So say I've got some circle. Oof, that's kind of ugly, but that's OK. It's got a uh, radius R. What would two radians look like? Two radians is going to be an angle in here so that this arc length is going to be equal to two radii, two radii. So that's where the term radian is coming from, by the way. So if this looks like it's about that long, if I put it, uh, you know, in arc form, this would maybe this would be one and then this would be two. So if this, nah, I'll just draw it kind of roughly there. Mm, no, it would be bigger than that. Sorry. If this is R, it'd be more like over here. <clears throat> so if this arc length from here to here is equal to 2R, twice times the radius. So if the radius is 5 and this arc length is 10, then that means this angle in here is equal to 2 radians. If this radius is 5 and my angle is such that the arc length is 15, then that means I would have 3 radians in the angle. So this is exactly what a radian is. And it's it's so when you really wrap your head around it, I know I'm taking a lot of time talking about this, but when you really wrap your head around it, you can see how radians are a much more natural way to describe angles, especially in the context of angles inside circles, than degrees are. They're much more natural once you kind of let this idea settle in. Plus they get pi involved, right? And pi is just, you know, anytime you've got arcs, any kind of curved thing, you know, pi gets involved, it should be involved. So, uh, and degrees kind of don't deal with that. <clears throat> All right, now let's get back to something more concrete, dealing with that formula I wrote down. So example four says, find the arc length, that's arc length mm, I didn't write it right sorry find the length of an arc find the length of an arc of a circle with radius 25 centimeters that subtends an angle of 45 degrees. OK, S is equal to theta times the radius. So we're doing S is equal to do we plug in 45 degrees? No, we must change degrees to radians. 
This formula, so I just went through that whole spiel about how radians are so nice with arc length and all that. So we must convert our angle to radians before we can use it in this formula. So let's say must convert theta to radians. Always, when you're dealing with formulas like this, you must convert theta to radians. So 45 degrees times pi radians over 180 degrees, just mimicking what I did earlier with the, that conversion rate. I'm going to skip ahead and say that that is equal to pi over four radians. I'll let you figure out the fraction stuff in between. So S is equal to theta, which is now pi over four, times the radius. There we go. S is equal, can, any simplification here? No. So I'll just say 25 pi over 4. Oh, by the way, centimeters is the unit. OK, so hopefully that's straightforward. As long as you remember to convert your angle to radians, the formula is not too complicated. OK, what about area of a piece of a circle? So to find the arc length of some piece of a circle, we multiplied the circumference, which makes sense because arc length is just a piece of the circumference by the piece of the circle that we have. So what about finding area of a piece of a circle, which by the way, we call a sector. So to find area of a sector, so instead of arc, we're, when we're talking about area, the piece of a circle, finding its area, it's called a sector to find the to find area of a sector of a circle, we multiply. So last time we multiplied circumference because that was the entire arc length, but now we're going to multiply the circle's area by the piece of the circle that we have. By the way, that piece of the circle that we have will be the same theta over 2 pi by the piece of the circle. A will be equal to circle's area, which is pi r squared, and then times the piece of the circle that we have, which will be theta over 2 pi. So what I'm doing is I'm finding the area oof, in here with some angle theta, some r. So this angle here, which I kind of, yeah, that's theta. <clears throat> So to find the area of a sector of a circle, this formula will clean up a little bit. If I if I want to write it all nice, I can say one half theta and then r squared because the pi's cancel, pi's cancel. The two is still there. That's the one half theta still there. R squared still there. So it doesn't clean up as nice as arc length, but it still cleans up pretty nice. That's the area for the sector of a circle. And since I'm trying to move fast, I'm not going to run an example of this, but it's kind of the same idea where you want to make sure your theta is in radians before you manipulate or before you use this formula. And but other than that, other than that detail, it's really just kind of a plug in and uh, and simplify fractions as necessary, right? So <clears throat> I'm going to skip running an example with that formula and go straight into 5.2, which is trigonometry of right triangles. So the first section, we didn't even really get into trig. You could argue that was geometry more than trig, right? Because I didn't introduce sine, cosine, or tangent, those kind of fundamental trig functions. So now we're finally going to look at, or rather we're going to have our first look at actual trig functions. Though we won't actually call them functions yet, we're just going to kind of still look at more of the geometry of these trig functions. Um. <clears throat> OK. So let's say we have a right triangle. And 
and some angle theta there inside the right triangle. And I'm going to go ahead and label this side down here, the adjacent side to theta. Because it's next to theta, so this side is adjacent to theta. So adjacent just means next to. So if you're sitting adjacent to somebody, you're sitting right next to them. This side is opposite to theta. So notice this is all in the context. These two sides are labeled in the context of where theta is. So this side is adjacent to theta. And this side is opposite to theta. And then what do we call this side here? Because this side you might say, well, it's also adjacent to theta, but it has a special name on a right triangle. It's called the hypotenuse, hypotenuse. Hypot hypotenuse. <clears throat> OK. We already know some stuff about right triangles. I know that this side squared plus this side squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared, Pythagorean theorem, right? So we already know, we already know how the sides are related. If I just in the, uh, just uh, using letters here, A, B, C, because that's traditional, uh, A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. So I know how the sides are related in a right triangle. Pythagorean theorem, done, good. What about the angle? How, so this is the big question for this section, how are, uh, how are the sides related to theta? So I've kind of set the stage here for how we're gonna say they're related to theta by drawing this triangle with the sides labeled as they relate to this angle theta with adjacent, opposite, and then of course the hypotenuse. How are the sides related to theta? Well, we have a function. We have a function called sine that says Mm. Yeah, that's fine. Sine of theta, so I'll put parentheses around theta to emphasize that that's the input of the function there, and we abbreviate with just SIN. Sine of theta is equal to the ratio. It's not equal to one of these sides. That would be too easy. If it just, if you had a function that said sine of theta and then it just gave you the length of one of the triangles, or render the sides of the triangle, that'd be too easy, right? It gives you a ratio of two of the sides. And in fact, it gives you the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse. Okay, so this angle, I mean, uh, this, this, this function takes in theta in an angle takes in an angle and outputs a ratio of what? What is the ratio of the side lengths of a triangle, right triangle? That's what all of the trig functions are going to do for us. They take in an angle and they spit out a ratio of side lengths. The question is just which side lengths, right? Which side lengths? Well, in particular, sine of theta gives you the opposite over this ratio, opposite over hypotenuse. Then we have a function. So I'm taking a lot of time here just to really emphasize what these functions are doing called cosine. that says, and this is how we abbreviate it, COS of theta gives me the ratio of 
the adjacent side to the hypotenuse. OK. So this function takes in an angle and outputs a ratio of the side lengths. Which side lengths? Well, the adjacent and the hypotenuse. And we have a function called tangent. What is left? What else can it relate? And this is how we abbreviate it. T A N of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. All right. So as quick as you can, memorize these three. <clears throat> you may have seen it abbreviated as S SOHCAHTOA, C-O-A, what? What did I say? Uh, S-O-H-C-A-H and then T-O-A, abbreviating sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent. All right. Okay, now we have some other trig functions which I don't want to do yet. So, what time is it? Good. This class ends at 3.15, right? Yes, okay. Okay, so let's take a deep breath before we really get into using these. And now let's go for it. So, example one, example one. Given the triangle, triangle below, find the values of the three trig functions that I just uh, wrote down up there. All right, now here's the triangle. Let's do a common right triangle. Let's do a common right triangle. You may have, you may remember it, the three, four, five. The three, four, five right triangle. And where is theta? Theta is there. Okay. So, sine of theta, if theta's here, sine of theta is a ratio of the sides of this triangle. It is the ratio of the opposite side over the hypotenuse. Okay, it's that easy. That, that That's all there is to it there. Cosine gives a ratio of adjacent over hypotenuse. See where I'm going? And then tangent of theta. Okay, I'm going to call on somebody because I haven't engaged the class the entire time because I've just been like flying through this. So, uh, Bailey, what would uh, tangent of theta give me? Um, tangent of theta would give you... Um, sorry, it's 4 over uh, 3. That's right, 4 over 3. Good, four over three. So the hypotenuse not involved with tangent. Tangent just gives the ratio of the opposite over adjacent. Good, so, so far so good, fairly simple. <clears throat> One more thing, um, let's consider, let me see, da, 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 da. consider this situation. Let's say I have a three, four, five, and then another triangle that is just a scaled up version of it. Whoops, kind of went into that a little bit. A six, eight, ten. So you see that this is just a. If you remember, there's there's lots of ways we could describe these these triangles, but uh, they are similar. They are similar triangles because their sides are proportional. We also know that in similar triangles, their angles are equivalent. Okay. So what can I say here? Uh, sine of theta for the red triangle, we've already done this, this is four, it's the same one, four over five, cosine of theta is three over five, and tangent of theta 
is uh, uh, four over three. Okay, for the blue triangle, what will these end up being? Sine of theta is eight over 10, but what does eight over 10 reduce to? Four over five, right? Cosine of theta is uh, six over 10, adjacent over hypotenuse, so six over 10. Which is also which also reduces to three over five, or what? Well, I should say it, it reduces uh, to three over five. Doesn't reduce to the same thing, but and then tangent is supposed to be uh, opposite over adjacent. That's eight over six. But if I reduce that, I'm getting four over three. So what's going on here is these are all equal, right? These are all equal to each other. Why? Why are they equal? <clears throat> well, the angle theta is the same, right? If the, oops, if the triangles are similar, their sides can be different, but since their sides are proportional, meaning this is just a scaled up version of that one, or, or vice versa, this is a scaled up version of that one, the angle inside is still the same. Thus, when you input into this trig function the exact same angle, it should output the same thing, right? If it's well behaved, it should output the same thing, and it does. At first, it doesn't look the same, but as soon as you reduce it, it you find it actually is exactly the same, okay? So tying in there to similar triangles. So, and, and uh, another thing to point out from this is if you don't know the length of the sides, but you do know that sine of theta is equal to four over five, it doesn't tell you this, hmm, what am I trying to say? Ignore this triangle. <clears throat> if I told you from this triangle, if I didn't give you the sides, right, didn't give you the sides, but I said sine of theta is equal to four over five, that does not tell you that this side is four and this side is five, right? It could be any multiple, it could be any kind of ratio that's four over five. That's kind of one of the points here. Sine of theta does not give you, or none of these trig functions, do not give you the length. It does not give you directly the length of the sides. It gives you the ratio of the sides. So don't be fooled into thinking like, oh, sine of theta equals four fifths. That means the opposite side's four and the hypotenuse is five. No, it just means the ratio of the sides is four over five. The sides could be eight and 10, or they could be 16 and 20 or they could be 40 and 50. It could be any kind of multiple of four and five, some any other ratio, which there are infinitely many, right, that reduce down to four fifths. Okay, so trig functions super useful, but not that useful that they directly tell you the side lengths. Okay, new trig functions coming, here we go. We've got, so uh, let me just write this down again. I'm gonna abbreviate sine of theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, so that's O for opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse and tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. We have three other trig functions, less common, but you know, still important. We've got cosecant. Oh, let me write out the full name. Cosecant, which is abbreviated CSC of theta. Oh, yeah. I'll try to remember to wrap parentheses around the theta, but it's not critical. It's it's nice when you know to emphasize that that's the input of the function. Cosecant of theta is going to be the reciprocal of sine, so it's going to be hypotenuse over opposite. Secant, abbreviated S E C of theta, is going to be the reciprocal of cosine. And then we have cotangent, C-O-T of theta is gonna be the reciprocal of tangent. Okay. And later we'll actually have a name for, they're called reciprocal identities. Uh, we can, um, 
we'll deal with that later as 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 needed. <clears throat> OK, so example. Two. Sorry, let me close the window. The garbage truck is here. Okay. Find all six trig ratios. So that's another way to say that, you know, what the trig function is equal to. It's going to give a ratio, right? So I'm asking for ratios from the trig functions. Given the triangle below, and let's do another special triangle. You might remember a uh, special right triangle, a 5, 12, 13, and there's theta. OK, I'm going to go quick. Uh, remember that this is being recorded and you can always view it later. So I'm going to go quickly through these um, because I want to try and get through the next uh, piece of 5.2, which will be some special triangles with uh, special angles. I'd like to introduce those in the first lecture. So <clears throat> quickly. I will do sine cosine tangent here and then I'll do the other three here just for the sake of space. Sine of theta, theta is here, my opposite side is five, my hypotenuse is 13. Cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse, so 12 over 13. And tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent, so opposite being five and adjacent being 12. Now, cosecant, CSC of theta, secant of theta, and cotangent of theta now should be pretty straightforward once you have the first three. So remember that sine of theta and cosecant of theta are related by the, the reciprocals of one another. One another. One is just flipped upside down. So literally, uh, sine of theta being 5 over 13 means cosecant of theta is 13 over 5. Cosine of theta being 12 over 13 tells me that secant of theta will be 13 over 12. And tangent of theta being 5 over 12 tells me that cotangent should be 12 over 5. OK, so that's why I said earlier, if you understand these first three trig functions, then the other ones, you know, just a consequence of this. This is one example of, of that. <clears throat> All right, another example. Well, I hope you got that. I'll leave it there for another second. And, OK. <clears throat> Example three. Let's say if sine of theta is equal to 5 over 13, find the other 5. Uh, trig ratios. All right. Uh -huh. Sorry, one second and uh. I want to look at um, the homework for this section and and kind of identify a particular type of problem here. So we're based off of uh, one trig function. We want to find the other the other five. Let me see. Sorry. Da, 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 da. Okay, well, that's fine. Okay, sine of theta is 5 over 13. 
um, find the other five trig ratios. So we have the opposite over hypotenuse. We don't know what the opposite side is, right? It's not necessarily five. It's uh, this. It's just the ratio of opposite to hypotenuse is five over 13. So the, notice this is not asking us to find the legs of the triangle. It's just saying the five other trig ratios. But there is particularly one item missing here, which is the adjacent side, right? So where adjacent? How do we find that? Well, we know that opposite is some constant multiple of five, as is uh, the hypotenuse some constant multiple of 13. That means if we want to find the adjacent side, we can uh, use the Pythagorean theorem. And the Pythagorean theorem doesn't care if there's some constant multiple introduced, so it's just it's going to take care of that. It's going to come out in the wash. So that means we can set up our Pythagorean theorem to find that missing side, which there's my adjacent side. I'll just call it B. OK, and I'll just kind of skip ahead here, assuming you remember how to solve this square, both of these, right? Then subtract it, then take the square root and you'll end up with 12. So it's a, this triangle is some scalar multiple of one of those 5, 12, 13 triangles. Maybe it's a 10, 24, 26. We're not sure, right? But at least we know how to set up these other trig ratios now. So cosine of theta then will be adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent of theta, so that's adjacent. So opposite will be 5 over uh, 12. There's the, the opposite over adjacent. Cosecant of theta will be the reciprocal of the sine theta, so 13 over 5. Secant of theta will be the reciprocal of cosine, so 13 over 12. And cotangent will be 12 over 5. Again, these are not the lengths of the side. It would be incorrect for me to say, oh, look, that means it looks like this. Or wait, you know, if I said this, I would be wrong. It's some scalar multiple of this triangle. So if I wanted to say like add like a like something like K on the back of all of these and then say K is some natural number, you know, so it could be like K is one if it's a 5, 12, 13, or maybe it's K is two and it's a 10, 24, 26, or maybe K is three and it's a 15, uh, 36, 39, or maybe some number in between even. Um, then that would be more appropriate to say. So even though this is not asking for the legs of the triangle, it's only asking for the trig ratios. It's still, you know, it's still a good exercise. And one of the key things to remember is that if you're missing one of the one of those uh, parts of the ratios, like the adjacent side in this case, use that Pythagorean theorem. You're in the context of a right triangle, right? So use that Pythagorean theorem to find that missing side. <clears throat> All right, now let's get into it. So I'm gonna do one more thing and then um, get into these, or rather this is the last thing, the special triangles, special triangles with special angles. I've already uh, noted some of the special angles we're gonna be dealing with. Why are they special angles? Well, uh, they come from special triangles and they also uh, output nice clean answers from our trig functions. So consider a box that is one by one. I'm constructing one of the special triangles right now. One by one. Back before the time of Pythagoras, people thought as you might intuitively think that this length here should be one. It's not, right? We know from the Pythagorean theorem that it should be square root of two, right? Square root of two there. So it's longer than one, right? It's like 1.4, etc. So <clears throat> this one by one box or square with a diagonal through it constructs one of our special right triangles which is actually isosceles, both of its legs are one, right? Because it comes from the construction of a square. And in particular, its angles are 45 degree angles. And now if it's isosceles, that means both of the angles are the same, right? If I put that in terms of radians, 45 degrees, 
45 degrees is pi on four. Hopefully you can see that, that's pi on four there. So degrees, radians, all right. So what is sine of pi on four? Sine of pi on four, now see, inputting an angle there. Pi on four, 45 degrees, we're in this triangle. Sine gives me opposite over hypotenuse. There it is. But does anyone remember what this would be if you rationalize the denominator? Because we are going to need to do that. Multiply by square root of 2 over square root of 2 in the top and bottom will end up with 2. In the denominator, square root of 2 in the top. We're going to be dealing with square roots a lot with these special triangles. OK, so there's sine of pi on 4. What is cosine of pi on 4? It'll be the same. It'll also be 1 over square root of 2 because it's isosceles, right? So 1 over square root of 2, which will turn into square root of 2 over 2. What about tangent of pi on 4? It'll be, well, this is nice, uh, opposite over adjacent, 1 over 1, 1. OK, nice. And by the way, pi on 4 is the same as 45 degrees, so if I replace any of these with 45 degrees, the answer will still be the same. All right, next special triangle. So again, why is this triangle special? Because of the way it was constructed. It's kind of like historically significant. Now, what's another special triangle? How about an equilateral? Or equiangular? Yeah, equilateral. All with side length 2. If it's equilateral, then all of its angles in here have to be 60 degrees, right? All equiangular, right? <clears throat> OK, but that's not a right triangle. Right, and we're dealing with right triangles. These trig functions tell us about right triangles. So let's, how can we construct right triangle out of this? Well, split it in half, split it in half right down the middle. And we have this angle being 60 degrees now. I'm gonna blow it up so I can write it a bit easier. That angle is 60 degrees. This top angle that I've split right down the middle now is 30 degrees. And how long are these sides? Well, this side is still two. This side down here got split right in half. That's a one. And if I wanted to solve for this missing side, I would say, OK, Pythagorean theorem, one squared plus that missing side squared is equal to two squared. B is equal to square root of three. There it is. There it is. We call this a 30, 60, 90. The other one we call a 45, 45, 90. And by the way, in terms of radians, what does it look like? If I just quickly convert, oof, that's ugly. If I convert all of these angles, the side lengths are the same. If I convert these angles to radians for you, this is pi on three, so 60 degrees is pi over three. 30 degrees is half of that, pi over six. Okay, so what is sine of, oops, what is sine of 30 degrees? Well, if this is the angle in question, what's opposite to that? One, and what's the hypotenuse? Two, so sine of 30 degrees is one over two. What is cosine of pi over 6, which by the way is also 30 degrees? Well, up here, if I look, here's my 30 degree or pi on 6 angle. I want relative to this angle, cosine is supposed to be adjacent, square root of 3, over hypotenuse. What about cotangent of pi over 3? 
cotangent is supposed to be like the reciprocal of tangent, so it should be adjacent over hypotenuse. I got to find that pi on three angle. Here it is. Pi on three, I want adjacent over opposite. And then if I wanted to rationalize the denominator on this, it would end up looking like that. OK, so these are the special triangles, 30, 60, 90, and 45, 45, 90, and where they're constructed from. Oh, we can do this last thing real quick because uh, it's easy. <clears throat> to find other angles, because there are like way other angles other than just 30, 60, and 45, right, which are the only ones I've identified so far, to find angles in between, just use calculator. So for instance, if I said, what's cosine of 20 degrees? Ooh. Oh, you gotta be kidding me, where's my calculator? Oh, I can use the one on the computer. So you would make sure your calculator's in degree mode, okay? So make sure it's in degree mode, not radian mode. If you don't know what that means, you can stick around after class and I'll tell you. So cosine of 20, just type it into the calculator. I'm gonna get 0 0.94. So that's just rounding from the calculator. Or what's sine of like um, 2.3 pi? Well, I would make sure my calculator's in radian mode this time because that's clearly not degrees, it's radians. And I'll do 2.3 times pi and then put that into my trig function of sine, right? Yep. Uh, and of course it didn't read it right. What do you want from me? I'm using this calculator on the on the computer and it's like a nightmare. Okay. Okay, and it's giving me 0 0.81 approximately. So I should say approximately for both of these. So whenever you're asked to find an angle that's not one of these special angles, not pi on 3, pi on 6, pi on 4, not 30, 60, 45, then you just use the calculator and you approximate. And if it's in degrees, you're going to make sure your calculator's in degree mode. You should see a button that says like DEG maybe. And if it's in radian mode, you'll make sure, or rather if the input is radians, you'll need to make sure your calculator's in radian mode. <clears throat> okay, we'll finish 5.2 and 5.3 next time. You should be able to do the homework for uh, 5.1 at the very least. And you are all good to go unless you want to stick around and ask questions, especially if you're not sure how your calculator works. <clears throat>